In 1534, Henry VIII visited this manor house in Buckinghamshire, the first of many visits by the king and his daughter Elizabeth. But the owner knew that the royals expected only the biggest and the best, so he had his home transformed into a palace. But magnificent though this Tudor building is, it's hardly big enough to support the king and his entourage of over 300 courtiers. It must have been at least twice this big. So where's the rest of it? And what exactly does it take to build a house fit for a king? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. We've come to Cheney's Manor at the invite of Elizabeth MacLeod Matthews, who's lived here since the 1950s. She and her late husband spent decades trying to decipher the house's complex history, with only partial success. And even the famed historian Nicholas Pevsner, who spent 50 years chronicling Britain's architectural heritage, found the building a mystery. He came in the 60s, and he came and had a leisurely tea, and chatted to my husband about it. What did he think about it? Um, he did mention, I think, that the brickwork was similar to the brickwork at Eton College and that it was very, very early brick. And uh, he said that it was a great puzzle. Well, the country's greatest expert on architecture may have been stumped by this puzzle, but it looks like somebody's been able to solve it. Jonathan? Tony? I don't know why we're here. We've got loads of good standing archaeology, we've got lots of documents, and Mick, I've just been looking at the guidebook to Cheney Manor House, <laughs> yeah. and there's even a painting of what this place would have looked like in Tudor times. Uh, who painted it, you ask? Jonathan Foyle. <laughs> we, we didn't burn every copy. Um, <laughs> Now, this, you'll see this as a suggested appearance, you know, like, um, like TV dinners that never work out that way when you serve them. Um, and it may be the same here, that when we look for the proof behind this speculative vision, that it's much more complex than I've initially suggested. So I want to learn more, that's the point. Jonathan's serving suggestion, painted from the church tower, is based on the buildings that remain on the site. Namely, this western wing and this southern wing, which we believe were here at the time of Henry's visits, as well as evidence of a medieval manor hall, which would have been the focal point for eating and entertainment. A historical document mentions a wing measuring nine chambers from the church to a gatehouse. This could either run along the north or the east of the courtyard, with either one containing the grand gatehouse entrance. Jonathan's preferred option is two wings with the gatehouse to the east, giving us a palace large enough for a king and his entourage. We're talking about a house that Henry VIII visited and Elizabeth, up to a thousand people descending on it for periods up to a couple of weeks or, or more. It must have been a very big complex with lots of supporting structures. Mm. So my neat vision might be much more complex in reality. Mick, how do we explode Jonathan's cosy vision of what this place would have looked like? Well, I think we can look... The two wings that are on there that, uh, that don't exist today, we can have a look at those by putting some trenches across and see if there is any walls in the bottom of them. But, of course, the building itself is a piece of archaeology and it's full just by looking around the outside of, of, of clues of where walls have joined on, windows have been altered. So there's a sort of three-dimensional jigsaw to sort out of the building itself, Absolutely isn't Absolutely there? there is, yeah. I'm going to be really fascinated I to know. see what the difference is yeah. at the end of day three. You're going to make his life hell, aren't you? I am. <laughs> I want to know what the difference is going to be between this painting and what we finally come up yeah. with. Let's get on, then. And so our first trench goes in based on Jonathan's recreation. Here, on the proposed eastern wing close to where he believes there was a grand gatehouse. You're a bit previous, aren't you? We haven't even got the GFS results yet. Yeah, but I, I don't think it'll matter, actually. We've got a lot of clues as to what might be going on here. We know about these two wings. We can see where that step is there by the, 
by the fire yeah. alarm. And then on the other side, you've got a bit of wall sticking out. Well, that's the two bits of wall coming out in this direction. There's different sorts of brickwork there, aren't there? There's all sorts of stuff going on. We're going to have to spend a lot of time looking at that, because for now, it just tells us something's coming off in this direction. As well as rediscovering this structure and the rest of the palace, we hope to find out why much of this complex disappeared over the centuries because historical records show it was large and grand enough to play host to Henry three times and Elizabeth twice, a place where they and their entourage could rest, feast and hunt. The house's high status was due to one man, the first Earl of Bedford, John Russell, who had a meteoric rise through the Tudor court. He was in the service of a man called Sir Richard Jerningham, who was one of Wolsey's key officials. Now, what's important about that is that when Jerningham died... Um, Sir John Russell not only, if you like, stepped into Jerningham's job, he also stepped into his bed, he married his widow. <laughs> that was Anne that, Sapcott, Sapcott, who inherited Cheney's. And that's how he got Cheney's. But that coincided with Henry VIII taking Russell into the Privy Chamber. He was a gentleman of the Privy Chamber in 1526. Now, he was one of only eight people in the country who were allowed to touch the king, and even one of those eight, the barber, was only allowed to touch him when the king specifically invited him to do so. So Russell is one of those very key courtiers at the very heart of the Tudor court. So really, you could say that Russell was one of the eight most important men in the country at that time. Absolutely. Now, but what Henry also does is um, he gives him a wedding present, and he gives him the manor of Amersham next door. And that gives him the money to build a chain is. It looks like this wall's got plaster on it. It looks like it's got loads of plaster. It's interesting because it's just along the spout. It really suggests an internal wall, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Over at the wall beside the church, Jonathan and Bridget think they've found it's evidence of the other end of the eastern wing that Phil's digging. It looks at first like a junction, that doesn't looks it? quite but... different, doesn't it? Oh, look that's at... interesting, isn't it? Look at those diamond shapes there. What are they called, Jonathan? Diaper. Diaper. Diaper work, yeah, because they're diamond shaped. And they're 15th to 16th century. So, um, yeah, good diagnostic. And external, too. Absolutely, because why would you want decoration like that on the inside of your wall? Well, he wouldn't. You'd plaster it, wouldn't you? And we've got the plaster on the other side. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> this wall, with its plaster on the inside and elaborate brickwork on the outside, would give us buildings on three sides of the courtyard. But Jonathan feels it may also be the corner of a northern wing. A theory that's got the backing of Geophys, who found a possible wall line heading north. I mean, look, we've got this wing that's meant yeah. to come through here. Yeah. So, I mean, well, we've got this clear line. And, I mean, it's literally just in front of us. There. So where this bump in the grass is? Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, right. if we put a trench across here, yeah. am I in the courtyard now? Yeah. And is yeah. this the range? Yeah. So Trench 2 will go in on our possible northern wing over John's geophys anomaly. But the trenches are only part of our investigation because we're using the whole house as an archaeological resource. We've got Mick the Dig taking dendro samples from all over the house to date its evolution. Frustratingly, there are no pictures of Cheney's in its full Tudor glory. But Ray San, a trained architect before he took the Time Team shilling, thinks later illustrations of the manor may give some clues for his reconstruction. So when we got down here, uh, on the, we're on the lower floor now, the sixth lower chamber from the gate, you see the seventh lower chamber from the gate. And the house also has a fantastic document archive, including an inventory from 1585 that lists every possession room by room throughout the household. Valuable when trying to work out the exact layout of the house. Come and have a look at this. Oh, crikey, you know, you yeah, look that? at that. It looks like we've got... See that? There's a mortar surface there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the yeah. holes in the yeah. ground that will confirm or sink Jonathan's the theory. You must be inside a building. Hang it's... on, why do you say that that's a floor? It's, it's a... It's a laid mortar surface. It's very compact. It's evenly distributed. It's laid on these bits of these brick surface. It may have had a tiled floor actually on the top yeah. of it, yeah. which they lifted off. But that was, what you're looking at is actual foundation surface for a, a, a floor, I think. And they've got but nothing else over there. Now, this is really the good stuff. Look, we've got this, these mortar bricks in here. But look, it's bang on line. That's with the end of the wing. Lines Just up exactly where we want it to be. Why yeah. couldn't that be 21st century? It could be. I mean, there's still a lot of demolition rubble about it. But that, that looks to me, that looks to me Tudorish. 
I mean, one one, pe one piece yeah. of pot yeah, does not make a, a period. Yeah. But it, I would have thought we could be looking at, at that sort of period. It's almost like that Cistercian weir, isn't it, which is that sort of very dark green stuff, you know. Yeah, I think that's all right. Well, there's our first bit of Tudor. Done a good? Early days yet, Tony? Yeah. The evidence does suggest this wall is Tudor which, going by Jonathan's theory, means we should be close to the sort of grand gatehouse you'd expect at the entrance to a royal residence. But just as one piece of pot doesn't make a period, one wall doesn't make a wing. So we're putting in another trench to find the other side of our possible gatehouse wing. Trench 2 has also come up with the goods, and it's even more substantial than the wall in Phil's trench. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, that's wallish, isn't it's it? very wallish. <laughs> We've got the wall up here, and we've even got some flint footings, which, you know... Fairly typical, aren't they? Local resources, chalk and flint. Absolutely. Good, stuff. Good yep. for the Chilterns, yeah. Not only does this feature line up with the existing Tudor wall by the church, yep. there's even some traces of plaster on it, suggesting this could be the inside of our northern wing. It seems all our evidence confirms Jonathan's initial plans for the Tudor palace. And yet there are those amongst us who aren't so sure. That view looks very much like it is today, Ray Sun. Do you know what, when that was drawn? I'm not sure of the date, but there's certainly a progression of date through different paintings. This one here seems to be showing us a wall going across the whole front of that building. Right. And that's the, the windows, though, are very much what we've got there today, aren't they? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much exactly the same at this stage. I mean, just this wall, maybe right. an opening paying homage through to the church. But if we go back one further... Oh, crikey. All the decoration's gone from the top of the gable. Yeah. The windows are changed and the wall is still here across this bit. That's looking very downbeat in comparison to what we see now, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And even the path is going away from the building, not following the axis we showed earlier. No, it's not as straightforward as we thought, is it? No, there's a lot of changes going on. Well, it looks like the doubting Thomases have just jinxed the site because the eastern wing has suddenly become very confusing. So far, there's nothing in the trench where we expected to find the back wall. And the more we dig Trench 1, the less promising its archaeology becomes. Here's our Tudor wall. And that does line up exactly yeah. on the end of the building. We still don't really know whether we are in a building or, as this material here, this gravel material, might suggest that we're actually into a courtyard surface. The other problem, of course, is that we've got these walls here and we don't know, again, whether they're a building or whether they're garden features. The trouble is that they've been so smashed around that we got no idea where the floor levels were. Yeah. It is frustrating, isn't it? It is, but it, I mean, we often have this problem, don't we? We dig a hole for a specific purpose, to see if there's anything in it. Yeah. And there is something in it. And then we try and screw more information out of that hole than it's actually capable of giving us. We're now also having problems with the archives. We're talking 60 rooms at least from this inventory. Yes, yeah. um, housing 100 people regularly. Yes, indeed, yeah. And there's no way... A closer inspection of the 1585 inventory of the house reveals a complex of rooms that's too big to fit into our courtyard model. We know that there are nine chambers from the church to the gatehouse in one direction. Do we know where the gatehouse was? Well, you see, this is all part of the confusion that's left by an incomplete record. Back at Phil's Trench, we still can't find any evidence of another wall to make this arrange. I'm just hoping <laughs> this isn't all chopped out because this looks like service rubble. Well, it, it may well be, but if, if we've got... Um, a foundation mm. coming off of there, mm. it's going to be in there. Ray Sands got an explanation for this. It's just that it's one we don't want to hear. We've got the Tudor wall there coming off. Now, what we don't know is whether it's a building, a structure, or whether it's just a boundary wall. If we go back a little bit, what we're starting to see is a wall running for a flush, so it's more like a boundary wall. If we go back even further, it shows even clearer this strong wall all the way running across the front. It does suggest that that wall is no more than a boundary wall rather than a structure. Yeah, you can't really see any structure. It's, it's, it's still a bit confusing. It is, isn't it? I mean, I'd like a painting from the other side. That's what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got one of those. No, not at all. <laughs> we just don't have any evidence here to back up Jonathan's original theory for a gatehouse. Although the wall may once have been part of a larger wooden structure, for example, a gallery leading to the church. 
but it does mean our straightforward plan for this site is unravelling in front of our eyes. In fact, I've noticed that even our nice posh southern wing doesn't seem that posh close up. Mick, this epitomises it for me. Look, fantastic great wall, yeah. no window. Yeah. No window, no window, no window. About 24 chimneys, yes. so yes. loads of rooms. And this is on the south side of the building, which ought to have the windows in, looking out over bowling greens and stuff like that. It, it, it's like the rest of the house. It doesn't make much sense, does it? We're not going to solve it tonight, are I we? I don't think so. We need to think a lot more about it and look at the plans, I think. We're going down the pub. Come on. Glass of red wine, I think. Beginning of day two, and yesterday it all seemed so easy. We were looking for the house in which Henry VIII stayed, and it ought to be on all four sides of this big rectangle. And fair enough, when we dug a trench here, we found a Tudor wall, except it is a bit of a jumble and we couldn't find a room associated with it. But then we found another Tudor wall in this trench here, although, once again, as yet, there's no room with it. The problem is, then the archaeology started contradicting the architecture and the documents didn't fit in with the topography and basically nobody can agree precisely where this flipping house is. One thing we are certain of, Jonathan's neat little picture of it is consigned to the dustbin of history. Jonathan, should we put this straight in the shredder? It could be time to go back up the tower, okay. couldn't it? But not yet because we still don't understand what was here. What do we do? We've got to look over this way because we do have Tudor walls standing just beyond this site and we're taking our bearings from that. This is clearly in use through the Tudor period. Um, and so, if we go to the other side of that wall, maybe there's something over there that tells us more. Sounds like an act of desperation to me. <laughs> Hopefully this trench behind the garden wall will find the other side of the northern wing. But just to confuse matters, geophys have discovered these anomalies in the courtyard, suggesting two completely different shapes and sizes of that northern wing. And that means we'll need to dig two more trenches to test their results. And if that's not complicated enough, we seem to have lost the east wing entirely. The archaeology and archives now suggesting it was just a boundary wall. In the midst of all this contradiction and confusion, Stuart has been fertling around the site in his own inimitable fashion. And he now believes these massive earthworks to the north of the site could be the remains of the formal Tudor gardens. It's got mortar in it, hasn't it? Are there, any, are there any bricks in it anywhere? There is a little bit further up. We've got brickwork. Slowly but surely, Stuart's evolving his own very different theory as to the whereabouts of the Grand Palace. And the records we have of Henry's visits here show it would have been very grand. It belonged to John Russell, one of the most powerful men in Tudor Britain. And it didn't just accommodate the king, but also his full entourage of a thousand plus. The records show it was also at the very heart of a royal scandal. Henry was showing off Catherine Hurt. She was his trophy wife. He wanted everybody to see her. I mean, the irony is, of course, that a week later... She is denounced for adultery. And in fact, there is also evidence in the National Archives that while at Cheney's, you know, she was engaged in a liaison with Thomas Culpepper. Oh, really? Actually and here? Absolutely, absolutely yeah. here, yes. Yes, because the, 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 the evidence against her actually mentions Cheney's. With the archaeology still not giving us any results, Stuart's decided to do his own subterranean exploration. So there's a lot of myths attached to tunnels and manor houses and churches. People often yes. think it's a tunnel between the two. But more often than not, these things are actually drains. But actually that's even more exciting in many ways because the drains connect different bits of the house and the, the stables and dairies and all that sort of thing. Right. So if you can work out where the drains went, you can often work out where buildings were even when those buildings have gone. The results Stuart and Henry come up with throw a very large spanner in the works because they reveal a finely engineered drainage system that goes nowhere near the courtyard suggesting the main part of the Tudor Palace isn't where we're digging. This appears to be backed up by the archaeology up top. The new trenches in the courtyard have revealed nothing more than a collection of garden features. And as for the trench in the orchard... Absolutely nothing here, uh, Tony. When you say nothing, there's degrees of nothingness, aren't there? <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> Nullus. Oh, Lord. What? <laughs> what we're tracing, of course, is a wall that has a return on it. What it means is simply it doesn't extend this far. It's not a range, 
What we're looking at yesterday is an outbuilding. This is not part of an enclosing courtyard. So, doesn't that completely throw the shape of the building that we're looking for? It may do. Well, we, we have standing buildings surrounding this area. There's certainly, certainly an enclosed area of building. What shape that is, I mean, God only knows. I, I'm certain that I don't, <laughs> <laughs> as a starter. None of our options for the Northern Wing work, and yet we've got historical records that say it's there. There's no choice now but for the team to go back to the drawing board. I've got earthworks, landscape, maps and drains. They all seem to me to point in a slightly different direction to where we're hunting for the big house at the moment. You see, that strikes me as unlikely to be part of the, the court, mm. the main courtroom yeah. somehow. If you're approaching from that direction, you're going to approach from the back end of the church. Yeah. That's going to be the first thing you see, the rear of it. Yeah. And why would you want to approach from the back of the church? It seems just to turn its back on everything. You want to celebrate this building. Um, it's halfway through day two, and we've got almost nothing to show for it. Time for an archaeological council of war. When you approach, where is the main big house, do you think? We are sitting in the angle of it, but beyond, yeah. on the other side of the angle, toward the gardens and on the south front, I think there were bigger rooms that, uh, that have since so, been neatened up by the Victorians. This side of it feels quite like the rear of the building. There's not a lot of ornamentation. These are the smart lodgings. These have been retained. If you've got a house that's falling to bits, what do you do? You keep the best lodgings for yourself. No, I don't think they are, actually. There has to be something here which presents a kind of facade to when you approach it. So I'm looking at, like, two components, one going north-south and one going east-west. We reckon we've got a... We're in a complete state of confusion. We just can't agree how to fit the missing parts of the palace onto these elaborate standing buildings, which must have played a central role in Henry VIII's visits. But that suddenly changes when we get the dendro dates for the west and south wings. This bit here comes much later, in the summer of 1550. Hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> uh, when did Henry VIII come and stay here? 1541, 34 and 41. 41. And we've been assuming... Henry VIII's reign. This is not part of Henry VIII's reign in that case. <laughs> we've yeah. been assuming that this is the constant. This is the yeah. reason that we came here, because yeah. we've got a bit of the place where Henry VIII stayed. That's so nice. the, bu the building is elsewhere. Yeah, the buildings that uh, Henry saw are elsewhere. Are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Although he did see this one behind me. So this wing on which we've based so much of our digging strategy wasn't even built until after Henry VIII's death. And that means we can turn this dig on its head, distilling a new layout for the house. And this is it. With the main entrance to the west and a grand set of lodgings to the north overlooking terraced gardens, which is where our new trench will go in. Unfortunately, it's in the most inappropriate spot on the whole site, jammed in between a wall and our portable toilets. Ah, oh, the glamour of archaeology. Elizabeth's going to be really disappointed. Why? Well, because she's always thought that this building that she lives in is where Henry VIII came to visit. She's told everybody that. She's got a guidebook and everything. No, no, but she's... Thought, I mean, look, you've got um, Queen Elizabeth come and stays here for a, a month in 1570 and, and visits it repeatedly. She loves the old rambling house. We've got details about her secretary saying it's not in a decent state for her to come and stay. You know, we've still got a Tudor monarch staying here. It's just a different Tudor monarch. Yes, if you could loosen this lot up, that'd be a lot easier. Over at the portable toilets, it seems that the doubting Thomases were right. Ah. Within inches of the concrete surface, Phil's uncovered some tantalising remains. So what do you reckon then, Jonathan? Is it uh, Tudor? Well, what I can say is this, that all, all the characteristics are there for it to be generically Tudor. I mean, it's in, inevitably difficult... What do you mean, generically <laughs> well, Tudor? Well, because each site has its own brick-firing clamps and, you know, reuses material. It's set in soft lime mortar in the right way, the bricks are roughly the right size, and they seem to be making an English bond, which is um, the pattern of having the ends of the bricks all in a row, the sides all in a row, alternate, and they get fed up with that by about the middle of the 17th century, so it's good. It looks like we may be finally in the right place, but to be sure, we're going to have to move all our resources to the back of the house. But the royal appeal of Cheney's would have been much more than just the accommodation. The rolling hills of Buckinghamshire were the perfect location for Henry's favourite pastime, hunting, particularly its most noble form, falconry. 
In the last day and a half of our dig here, Carenza is going to try and learn the rudiments of this royal sport. Just hold that there, and she yeah. should. Now, the idea of looking across the shoulder at the bird rather than have the actual glove in front of your face is obvious. The bird hits the glove and comes up into your face, then it's going to hurt. She's got right. very big, powerful, and sharp talons. <laughs> right, so I just hold the chicken leg up. Oh, wow, and here she coming. comes. Like God, that's amazing. Glove. When this wild animal kind of swoops and lands on your hand. That still is the incredible. Most amazing thing. But these birds were valued for more than just their inherent beauty. They were there to hunt and kill food for the dining table. And to be successful in her challenge, Carenza will have to learn to control a cold, calculating killing machine with a top speed of over 100 miles an hour. What you have to remember with the bird of prey is it's not a creature with emotions. So you can love it to death, but it will never return that back to you. They're not designed to have affection um, because they are obviously instinct creatures mm. and, and, and they're born really to hunt, to survive. And you'll notice on her anklets, she's also got her bell. That's where that's attached. I know you can hear it all the time. What's the point of the bell? The bell is for when they've caught their prey, because they're not retrievers. They won't fly back and drop it at your feet, unfortunately. Their instinct is to drag it into a ditch or into a hedge and hide on it. So you have to listen out for the tinkling of that bell in order to find the dinner that's supposedly going on your <laughs> master's dining table. This uh, wall here, Phil, seems to be still running out. It almost looks like a bay window. You don't think Stuart could be right, do you? <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't rule it out in this instance. I mean, it looks like... Is that a join running along there? Yeah, it's a straight join there. So you've got the main wall coming along there, and then that bit going out there is actually tagged on. Yeah, and it's still running across there, so... Then, then I don't see why that shouldn't be a bay window. What you got there, then, Dave? I've uh, got this window glass oh, on one side of the wall here. Well, that is, I mean, if ever you needed nice. evidence, all this glass is coming by this big bay, isn't it? Yeah, there's more of it. Could have been quite a view down here, I reckon. It seems that this unprepossessing farmyard is indeed the front of the building Henry VIII visited. But funnily enough, this glass is about the only find we've uncovered. For a site steeped in history, it's almost barren. I haven't exactly had my work cut out here, but we've got some 12th century cooking pot here and another fragment there. And we have small amounts of 16th century pottery and we have a few small lace ends, two normal size ones and one rather larger sort of medallion man lace end. And these would have been used instead of buttons. If you'd come here not knowing that this was a site where Henry VIII and Elizabeth I feasted, yeah. what would you think the site was, given the finds? I would have said it was a bog-standard medieval site. I mean, where is the fine pottery and the fine glass and small finds like buckles and brooches and things like that? Where are they? Where's the buckles and brooches, Mick? Somewhere else is the answer, isn't it? <laughs> but, I mean, we're, we're not seeing the place that they're getting rid of the rubbish here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's going somewhere else. But it's so clean, isn't it? Yes. That, it, it is, yeah. Yes, if you think there's yeah. several hundred years here, represented here, say, 300 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a social thing as well, isn't it, where the, the Tudor sort of peasant living in his little cot might chuck it out of the door... But at this level, this is, this is the top of society. Somebody's going to clean up after them, aren't they? Somebody's going to dispose of the stuff. It's not just going to get trampled into an earth floor because they haven't got earth floors. But even without fines, there's one person who thinks he can explain what was going on in this courtyard. And surprisingly, it does tie in with our new plan for the site. What we've got here is the wall of a narrow range of buildings which led from the chapel at one end with the hall and the big house at that end. Why do you say a narrow range? Well, it's like, it's like a corridor, because this being one side of it, we're on the outside, that's on the inside, and where that wall is there... This one here? Yeah, that's on top of what we think might be a Tudor wall underneath. We can't prove... That's speculation, but we haven't found any evidence of any buildings over there. If I uh, draw it on, on here for you... Hang on, where are we? We're, we're stood about here at the moment. Yeah. What we seem to have is, a, is a, a wall that came off the end of there to close a, a courtyard, and here we have a corridor, a narrow corridor range coming down here to join the chapel there. Yeah. That would link into where the hall was, there, and then coming off from there would be this big fine building that we've been looking for. This is the bit that connects the big smart house with the chapel at this end. 
It might not be as glamorous as we'd expected, but this narrow range is the one that features in the 1585 inventory, running from the church to the grand building fills digging. Overall, our new design for the site is shaping up as something more impressive than we could ever have imagined. You invited us here in all good faith to help illustrate the story of Henry VIII and your house, and now we've turned the whole story upside down. How do you feel about that? I think it's rather fascinating, actually. I think it's wonderful. A really big change, isn't it? I bet you never thought that the key to this whole site would be this rather unprepossessing area between the wall and the loo. Never. Absolutely never. And it is. It's fascinating, isn't it? What have you got, Phil? Well, it is just amazing. And we've got this massive piece of Tudor masonry, beautiful bowy window actually tagged onto it with superbly fine, thin glass from the window and then this lovely little drain running inside the building. I mean, tomorrow, that's where I want to be, inside, actually in the building, to try and find out what the building was used for and who might have lived there. End of day two, and there's been a sea change in our understanding of the site. And the very good news is that everyone now agrees on the same plan, and this is it. This tiny yellow bit here represents the trench that we've just been looking at, and the idea is that it's part of a huge range, this salmon pink thing, around which there is a lot of other buildings, which are a very long way away from where we are originally looking. And tomorrow, we'll see if they're right. It's the beginning of day three at our dig at Cheney's Manor, where the archaeological mist is finally clearing, and at last we found the house where Henry VIII stayed. The first bit we discovered was just round the corner there, so we've had to shift these toilets. But the big problem is we've got the catering bus here, we've got these shed things behind it, we've got the kitchen, we've got the St John's ambulance here, we've got all this concrete. Stuart... We're not going to be able to shift all this lot and dig up the concrete in time to find the rest of the house, No, we? not at all, no. But we have got one fixed boundary to work from now. We've got a bit of the building. We can make an estimation of its length and we can make an estimation of its width. After two frustrating days, we've turned the plan for this site on its head. Replacing Jonathan's original theory of a quadrangle building for this new layout. A layout that now seems to be confirmed by Phil's trench where this wonderful bay window has been unearthed. So we've got a group of bay windows on that north side looking down onto the gardens. Which is all the terraced area. Yeah. Right. Uh, we also think we've now found the main entrance to the complex, which includes some of this standing building. Jonathan's thinking seems to be that we've got the gatehouse is actually not a building with a with a tunnel under it and arches, which is what my initial thought That's what was. I've been thinking of yeah. for three days. More likely, a couple of buildings either side of a passageway, mm. yeah. which would have been cobbled, of which that's one, and the other one probably ought to be somewhere here. But the only way we can be sure we've got the right dimensions is to dig and geofizz this whole farmyard. So bish bosh here and bish bosh over there? I, I would have thought so, yeah. There's a lot to do with just a day to go. Our new plan may be causing headaches for the archaeologists, but it's completely transformed our understanding of the archives, including this comprehensive 1585 inventory of the house, which John and Carenza feel may establish the location of Henry VIII's bedchamber. King Henry, King Henry VIII's arms in it. So, because we know from the will that the state bed for Henry VIII was in the lower chamber... Mm. And do you think we can work out where that actually may have stood on the ground outside? Well, to know that, we'd have to ask Jonathan what he thinks the measurements of these rooms were. Right. Well, this, uh, this has developed a bit, Phil. Well, yeah, what the idea was, what we thought we'd do was extend across the, uh, across the trench yeah. to see whether or not we could get another bay window just to give ourselves a bit of room, see? Yeah. Well, look, look, we've got this big thing coming round here. It's a nice big feature, too. It's not quite the same as that one, though, is it? This no, one... it's, it's rounded. Yeah. No, I reckon it might be, actually. See that, that um, brickwork down the centre? Yeah. If that is, you know, a deliberate wall, it's typical of a, a, of a garderobe. But if you find organic deposits around the side, I mean, it, you know, it could, could be a loo, you know? Could be. It's the right sort of human frame for it. That's a lure. 
This is the piece of equipment that we have to try and teach you to use. It's basically dummy prey. Carenza's now halfway through her introduction to that essential royal Tudor pastime, falconry. And onto this we tie a piece of food, which is obviously the bait for the bird. And the idea is to try and present this lure to the bird in flight, uh, teaching it to, to chase the prey as it would naturally in the wild. So what you're doing is you're swinging it forwards, up and over. Right. So she forwards. now has a couple of hours to master the art of controlling a bird of prey as it attempts to rip the bait from her hand. So then you're presenting the lure forwards, stepping round and keep the momentum swinging. And that's the point at which the bird has gone like that the bird and you've moved the lure away. The bird have past you and gone off again. OK, so it's round, round, forward, round. And oops, yes. sorry. Oh, wow, well, that's too bad. Yeah, actually, you got it? it. I think it's going to need a lot of practice, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's just all... it's learning to control something that's very easily out of control. Well, it's all right. I can hit myself in the face with the lure. It's one thing. <laughs> if I get hit in the face with the bird, it's a bit different, Well, exactly. After the thrill of the archaeology in Phil's Trench... Our new targets at the rear of the Grand Lodgings and in the gatehouse area have produced disappointing results. Still got the chalk, the flint and a mix of bricks within it. Mm -hmm. So it really does look like just a sort of a, a demolition or a sub-base kind of fill. We're straight down onto this um, very gravelly, almost natural type stuff. It's natural there. It's quite dirty here and totally sterile. There's no bits of CBO. It looks terrible stuff to do. It is, it is a pain, I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm having a... but just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it wasn't there. Hey, Rick, the one thing we desperately need to know at the moment yeah. is the difference in height between this chalk and flint surface in here yeah. and the walls in Phil's trench. All right, see if it's the same foundation there. Yeah. yeah. See where you are. OK, well, I've, I've already taken points over there, so uh -huh. if I take a point um, in front of the bridge... Please, Excuse if me, you bridge. would, yeah. Can I squeeze in? Yeah, and I can compare the two. And see what the difference is. So that's about 45 centimetres lower, lower here. So this is is that much lower than Phil's yeah. so walls? Quite yeah, quite a bit lower. That it almost it? suggests we've sort of got horizontal truncation. And what does that mean, horizontal truncation? <laughs> Someone's come along with a big fish slice and gone... <laughs> right. Spliced off the top. The modern farmyards destroyed much of the foundations of the palace but there are still enough clues, including the Tudor remnants in this building, to keep the archaeologists happy. What about your gatehouse and what I, was I, supposed to be going on around I, this area? Well, the, I mean, that, that structure there I mean, is much, much altered, and, but yeah. if that's the site of the gatehouse, uh, not a typical building with an arch through it, but two flanking buildings with a gate in between. Sort of like lodges with yeah. a gate. Yeah, yeah. I, I see no reason why all the stuff that's going on outside it, a track up from the woods, actually doesn't have much evidence for building right. it. I don't see why it should. So you, would, you don't want to alter your sort of suggestions of the layout? I think there's now too much it. evidence for the approach from this direction to question that on the basis of finding natural under a later soil. There's only so many places in this farmyard we can dig and it's becoming clear that they're not going to yield any archaeology. But all is not lost. Phil's trench proves that some of the structure was preserved underground, unfortunately in areas we can't dig, like these barns. Bridget, can you see? We've got a bit of a problem with these trees. <laughs> Get the flippers out, then. But we can geofizz, so Stuart's now measuring out the plan for the accommodation block on the ground, which John can then survey for any surviving archaeology. This is really how hawks would have been carried in Tudor times. Yes, this is the cadge, the forerunner of the Range Rover. The cadge. And this is where we get these wonderful sayings to cadge a lift and uh, the old codger, because uh, someone that carried the birds, if uh, he was, uh, had a few grey hairs, he'd actually be known as an old codger. So um, we get these lovely phrases from this frame. Oh, codger, got the birds with you? <laughs> I've got the birds, thank you. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well... We've only been practising this this morning, yeah. so I'm not sure it's probably the answer. We haven't tried this with the actual birds at all yet, but hopefully we'll be able to sort of fly the birds around and get them to come to the lure and fly past me and it'll all look wonderful. She's very alert. Yep, she knows Carenza <laughs> is the person to watch already, so we'll just keep an eye on her. Keep turning to face her all the time. OK, Carenza, start swinging. She's a good distance away. Prepare to pass. And pass. Well Way, done. Fantastic. fantastic. Tony, if we can run the other side. Yep. Wow. Good girl. What we're trying to do is keep well out of, yeah. of reach. OK, here she comes again. Prepare to pass. Pass. Whoa. 
Well done, fantastic. Okay, start swinging. We'll try and call her back over, and I think we'll try and give her her reward. Okay. Nice swinging, nice and fast. Get ready to throw up. And now. Yes. yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. Was it scary? It was very exciting. Yeah. Um, it's such a split second between knowing whether it's going to work or not, that you don't really have time to be scared. But that, that moment when I actually pulled it away fast enough and she went past, it was just fantastic. You it can see amazing. why it might have been so attractive to the Tudors. It's, it's very modern, all that speed and turning. It's like motorbikes or cars. I mean, or my, my, my heart's going... Dum, 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 dum. Right, it's exhilarating, isn't it? It, it really is, is. yeah. 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 It's thrill of the fantastic. chase, that's what it's all about. Yeah. This is a cracking piece of archaeology, isn't it? Thank you, Mick. It really is. Do we understand it now? <laughs> I think we actually do. I think what you're looking at here is the front facade of the Royal Lodges. We think it's actually built in probably two phases. They put up one skin of bricks and then added. But f the most obvious thing are these two bay windows, one there, one there and one over there, which they've actually added on to the front of the building. So it's got a whole series of glass windows up the front of it. It really shows how important this is. And we check this out. It could have been a garda robe. Turns out that, in fact, it is just a massive bay window yeah. yeah we've had glass out of here as well oh, so nice. Nice. anyway yeah. once we come into the building yeah we've got a room on that side yeah and a room on that side so a partition wall down the middle well it's, it's more than a partition look at the size of it look of the course, it's, big as, it's big as the outer wall isn't it <laughs> and you see here look you see we've got a whole series of these little niches cut into that wall now i reckon that's where the flooring joist would have been so if you allow yeah. for the flooring joists yeah. and allow for the floorboards on the top, mm. I reckon that floor level is about here and you would have looked out down yeah. over yeah. the valley. So it would work out to be about 30 foot in depth and um, yeah. you could say it is literally palatial. We may not have found a Tudor ensuite bathroom, but these remains show the sheer scale of the apartments that would have greeted the royal entourage. This new layout has got one final treat in store for us. After careful measurement and cross-referencing with the 1585 inventory, it seems we may have stumbled across the bedchamber of a certain Henry VIII. By 1541, when Henry came here, he had a badly ulcerated leg and he wasn't as mobile. Uh, and in fact, um, he would have stayed in this building on the ground floor, not the first floor, as you know, a monarch would normally have done. It? Well, we think that because when Henry VIII's bed was actually given away by the second Earl of Bedford in, in 1585, it was actually on the lower floor, in the lower chamber. Now, the royal bed was absolutely huge. You didn't just bring it into the room. It was probably built inside the room and wouldn't go out through the door. It's bizarre, isn't it, that we're in this old bus, and yet at some time in history, King Henry VIII might have been just here, gazing out into the garden with his separated leg. Well, I think that's entirely possible. And this would have been just one small part of the fair lodgings that Sir John Russell had built for his royal visitors. Because wedged between the dining bus and the portable toilets, geophys have been able to confirm Stuart's suggested extent of the missing Tudor range. As we get up to the line, there's a definite response where the uh, front wall is. Anything? Yeah, pretty much where they around, where they put the marker. We've not done that much radar on the site before, have we? Uh, no, and I'd be happy no. not to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Look, key points. Yeah. There, in the shed, where you sent us, <laughs> we've got a clear demarcation there. Right. And that lines up perfectly. Oh, excellent. That's with Phil's the walls excavation Phil's walls, trench yeah. going yeah. through there. Possible back wall at that point there, ah, running yeah. through. Just this side... Of the bus. Under the concrete. So if we hadn't <laughs> have parked the dining bus there, we might have been able to have a look at it. And if there hadn't been concrete. And it hadn't been concrete, <laughs> right. But, but at the... least it's given us a width for the yeah, building. It's brilliant, yeah. isn't it? These results fill in the unknowns on our plan, giving us a wing that was 30 feet at its widest and ran from the gatehouse all the way to the church. It's the final bit of evidence Jonathan needs. This array of buildings we've got with the, with the glass looking down yeah. onto the gardens mm. and... Where we started with this courtyard, we still have that. We still have the hall there and the lodgings. Yeah. What we've discovered since is a building something like six times the size of the one we started <laughs> off with. And it's now looking much more like a small town. Yeah. And yet all that now remains of this grand palace is a beautiful fraction of its former glory.
John, we've got this picture now, this vast complex of buildings here in Tudor times, but they're not here. They've gone. Where did they go? Well, in 1627, the family here simply up sticks and moved to Woburn. They were in financial difficulties. They had three houses in this area, so they simply left this one, and Woburn was their best house. So then a tenant farmer came in here and simply farmed the land, but he didn't need all this huge house. So he moved into the older house over there. The state apartments became derelict, and this house was used simply for storage. Is that it? It's a rather sad story, isn't it? No, but there's, uh, there's, there's more to it, uh, because uh, we know, in fact, that um, the state apartments were becoming derelict. They decided to remove the valuable glass, uh, and there's a reason for that, which also explains why there are no windows in this wall. The big mystery. So the big why? mystery, because in 1747, Parliament decided that it would extend the window tax, one of the big, you know, uh, sort of special stealth taxes of the day. Uh, and so um, the uh, tenant farmer simply wrote to the Bedford Estate Office and said, well, fill in as many windows as, as possible. So out of 100 windows, they filled in 60. And of course, by that time, the Russells had built this wing, and we know that now from the Dendro dates. So this may well have been the bit they were really concentrating on. The state apartments were starting to be a bit expensive. So maybe when that came in, instead of just blocking up the windows, well, bother it, we'll just pull the whole lot down and we won't pay any tax at all. Elizabeth, I'm ever so sorry. You're going to have to rewrite your guidebook. Am I? Yeah, it is so, so different from how you thought. Really? Isn't yeah. that interesting? Oh, well, you Goodness. say, oh, isn't that interesting, but don't you feel a sense of loss? Well, I suppose I do, really, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but old Henry wasn't in your part of the house at all. No, that is sad. But the real story is, I think, much more interesting and more dramatic, really, than what was thought before. Behind us here, between there and there, you've got this enormous pair of gatehouses with this yes. great stately driveway going up here and beyond it over there there's a great hall and then over there the fine lodgings where the kings and queens of England looked out onto the lovely garden in the pouring rain just like us. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story of a grand medieval house turned into a palace fit for a king. Its facade further embellished with modish and very impressive bay windows by the time of Queen Elizabeth's month-long stay in 1570. And dendro dating shows that by this time they'd also added another wing to the south of the complex. In every respect, this house reflects the very pinnacle of the power and wealth of the Earls of Bedford, its Tudor owners. Well, now, that confirms the fact that we once read that it was called Cheney's Palace. Well, it is a palace, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And then it was called the Great House, and now it's just called the Manor House. Well, you can start calling it the Palace again. That would be rather yeah. fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> Three days ago, we came here looking for something like this, a house fit for a king encased in these beautiful, evocative Tudor surroundings. But it wasn't here. Instead, we found it round the back, underneath some ramshackle old barns. Which just goes to show, you shouldn't always believe what you read in the guidebooks. To take part in the online time trail and quiz, just go to channel4.com slash timeteam. Tonight at 7, Alain de Botton takes a different look at the art of travel. Coming up next here on 4, though, don't bank on The Simpsons and their money. 